Londor. They call it the Hollow Realm, and it has links to a primordial serpent, to New Londo, to Velka, the goddess of sin, and to the most intriguing, hard-to-get ending of Dark Souls 3. It's a hugely significant location from a lore point of view, and I'm confident that this is where the DLC will be based. Make Londor. Let me paint a picture of Londor for you. Londor is a society of undead, comprised of corpses and shades who have led unsavory lives. As such, these hollows are deeply detested and hated, which is nothing new for hollow kind, really. It's even been recorded that sometimes a hollow will use a purging stone to remove the physical effects of the undead curse, temporarily reversing their hollowing, and occasionally a hollow will even fool himself into thinking he's no longer cursed and will turn on his own kind. Which reminds me of what Hodrick says down here. This pit is for hollows, not for the likes of you sane folk. Or perhaps you are a hollow. Posing as otherwise? And I tell you these things because even though the Hollows of Londor are hated, even though they sometimes fight amongst themselves, they still remain a truly unique example of Hollows forming a society, and that is interesting. Because undead are a powerful force if they have a purpose. We see that in the Undead Legion who fought the Abyss, and we see that in every protagonist from a Dark Souls game, really. So, it begs the question, what are the Undying Hollows of Londor fighting for, and what are they bound by? The Age of Fire was founded by the old gods, sustained by the linking of the fire. But the gods are no more, and the all-powerful fire deserveth a new heir. Our Lord of Hollows, it shall be who weareth the true face of mankind. This is Yuria, seeker of the Lord of Hollows, and one of the three maidens who founded the Sable Church of Londor. The Sable Church translates to the Black Church, and its towers are said to resemble the eight jagged branches of the Morian Blade. The church is said to offer salvation to Hollows, which must be a pretty attractive tagline for cursed individuals. I'd wager that if I was cursed with undeath, then I'd be pretty open to a little bit of faith to keep me from hollowing. So it's very clearly implied that the Sable Church is what keeps the hollows of Londor grounded. This faith is not an oath taken lightly, however, because those who fuck up are exiled and they're given the words to the Atonement Miracle. Hollows who recite this miracle think that they're reciting words of forgiveness, but in reality, the Atonement Miracle makes you attract more attention from foes and increases enemy aggro range. That's a pretty evil punishment. Not only are you exiled, you're exiled and you have death following you everywhere. The three maidens who founded the Sable Church, they cut an imposing figure. All three are highly skilled fencers, so skilled in fact that they were able to found the Sable Church between just the three of them. The third eldest daughter is named Lillian, a woman who seems to have contributed a lot of the theology behind the church. She was the first to speak the words of the Londor Braille Divine Tome, and is also said to recount tales that portray the suffering and conflict of Hollows. Lillian is not featured in-game, not yet, anyway. The second eldest is Uria, and if Lillian was the speaker, then Yuria would be the swordswoman, as she is said to have claimed a hundred lives with her weapon, Darkdrift. This legendary cursed sword with an unseen blade that penetrates straight through shields. Nothing can defend from Darkdrift. And the eldest, the firstborn daughter? She's not been named, but we know that she exists because these three daughters founded the church, and the only others in this equation that go without names, well, they're the mother and the father of the three daughters, and surely these parents are important, right? Because why else would there be three founders that are referenced as daughters, with mentions to their order of birth? 
So the only reason I can think of that they would do this is that the parents are important. And I think I know who the mother might be, but that speculation will wait till the end of the video. At any rate, these three daughters are described as maidens of a primordial serpent, and when we murder Yuria, we figure out who this serpent is. God, I have failed thee. Greetings, undead warrior. I am the primordial serpent, Darkstalker Karth. I can guide thee and illuminate the truth. Your ancestor claimed the Dark Soul and waited for fire to subside. And soon, the flames did fade, and only dark remained. Thus began the Age of Men, the Age of Dark. However, Lord Gwyn trembled at the dark, clinging to his Age of Fire, and in dire fear of humans, and the Dark Lord who would one day be born amongst them. Lord Gwyn resisted the course of nature by sacrificing himself to link the fire and commanding his children to shepherd the humans. Gwyn has blurred your past to prevent the birth of the Dark Lord. I am the primordial serpent. I seek to right the wrongs of the past, to discover our true Lord. Primordial Serpent of Dark Souls 1, who corrupted the Four Kings, who polluted the Kingdom of Ulusil with the Abyss, is back. And now, through Yuria, through the Sable Church of Londor, the Pilgrims, Yol, Karth continues to seek a ruler of men. They failed me, every last one of them. They were strong, but saw not the truth. I am certain that you will prove different. Karth and the Sable Church are watching events in Lothric very closely, because the world is on the precipice of the linking of the fire, and the Sable Church are determined to influence that event. Hundreds of Londor pilgrims are sent towards the highest towers of Lothric Castle. So many of them have died on the way here, and they're presumably coming here because the Lothric bloodline is obsessed with creating a worthy heir to link the fire, and that's the event that Londor want to influence. However, they're kind of out of luck, because Lothric refused to link the fire, and you, the unkindled who the linking of the fire passed down to, by some twist of fate, met with Yol, a pilgrim who had all but given up. Ah, you have attained ample strength. All will soon be clear, my good lord. Thanks to thee, your soul is redeemed. Allow me to express my gratitude in his stead. When we meet with Yuria, she frequently mentions how she's keeping an eye on all of those who could potentially be a Lord of Hollows. Orbeck is one, Anri another, but she believes that you are the true Lord of Hollows, and compels you to strike down Orbeck before he becomes a threat, and to claim Anri's dark sigils in this ritual within the Dark Moon tomb. If you betray Yuria, you don't do her quest in time, or you straight up attack her, then the Pale Shade of Londor will hunt you down. But if you're allied with Yuria, then the Pale Shade will assist you throughout the world. Another thing to note is that many characters associated with Londor use bleed weapons like Dark Drift or the Morian Blade or the Mannequin Claws, and Blood Loss is also a proven way to slow the reanimation of the Undying. So that'd be a pretty popular weapon in a land full of hollows. It's amazing the level of depth in this game when you look into it. So let's talk about the Undying, about the Undead Curse, the Dark Sigils and the Dark Sign. I've noticed a trend, when characters talk about the dark sign, they often call it a shackle, something weighing men down. With dark unshackled, a curse will be upon us. And cast off the shackles placed upon your brethren. One who might shatter the shackles of fate. Shackle my fools who stay young for love, unaware of his grand illusion. 
The Undead Curse is often referenced as appearing after Gwyn linked the fire, so we assume that Gwyn is at fault somehow. It's the gods who shackled us, and while we don't quite know how it started, we do know what happens to Undead Cursed with the Dark Sign. For when the undead dies, it is never truly dead, but only one step closer to hollowing. Not all undead are hollows, but all hollows were once undead. You might be wondering, what are dark sigils? Well, I'm assuming that they're synonymous with the dark sign, and the description of the dark sigils says that they're a problem because our humanity literally leaks out of them, and the gap that that creates is filled with the accumulation of the undead curse. So our character is always in the process of losing his dark soul, becoming more like the hollows that all humanoid beings appear to have stemmed from. And for ages, undead have been shepherded towards the first flame, to fuel it, to link it, to sit at it and reset the world and keep the gods in their age of fire. But the world was never meant to be stuck in this age of fire. It was supposed to go the Age of Ancients, the Age of Fire, and then the Age of Man. Natural progression. But this age, this Age of Fire, it struggles to die much in the same way that the undead struggle to die. I mean, you even see the dark sign in the sky towards the end of the game. That's pretty symbolic. It is all a curse. <laughs> and it is your cursed flesh that will inherit the flame. <laughs> Undead are literally burned as fuel for the bonfires that perpetuate this age. And I had a realization, I finally understand that this is what we see in the opening cutscene. We see the soul of Cinder burning an undead to ash, assumedly to be buried in the untended graves, which, remember, are not far at all from the kiln. And then we arise from this undead ash as unkindled. Not just undead, unkindled. In Miyazaki's words, unkindled are undead who failed to link the fire and were burnt to ash. They exist to inherit the past and put an end to this cumulative tale. So the unkindled is special. We're not just cinder. We're not just the corpse of an undead. We're both. We're something new. A new species, for lack of a better word, that has a choice. The Undead Curse no longer has the power over us that it once had. We can choose to fuel the bonfires and burn like charcoal, or we could choose to embrace the Undead Curse itself. Let's go back to Dark Souls 2, where it actually foreshadows a lot of this happening. Vendrick, a past Lord of Light and a Lord of Mankind who lost himself to the curse, I think he knew that this was the way it would end, or at least he thought it would. With fire, they say, a true king can harness the curse. A lie, but I knew no better. Inherit fire and harness the dark. Such is the calling of a true leader. We are the unkindled who inherited fire. We are the cursed undead who harnesses the dark. We gain levels through the power of the dark sigil, and we even kill other powerful hollows and claim their sigils for our own so that we can be strong enough to claim the first flame for mankind. And that is a new ending. Our lord and liege, thine heart is fixed upon the linking of the fire. But brave usurper, I prithee, when the moment cometh to link the fire, wrest it from its mantle, so that we hollows in most honest shape of man may have it for our own. You want to know what confused me most in Dark Souls 2? I probably avoided talking about it because it didn't make sense, and I couldn't make an episode on something that didn't really make much sense, so the Prepare to Cry episode for Nishandra is missing, because I could not figure out her motives at the time, but now I think I get it. So she was the fragment of the abyss that usurped the Age of Fire from her Lord of Light, Vendrick. And after this, Drangleic faded into dark. So you think, great, she won. She got exactly what she wanted, right? The world has plummeted into dark, so surely she'd want to keep it that way, right? Wrong, because she calls us her undead. 
She guides us. She tells us where to find Vendrick. She tells us where to find the giants. She guides this bearer of the curse all the way to the first flame, and we kill her. That doesn't seem very smart, but she says, Brave undead. You have proved yourself to me. Now, be one. And now I think I understand. I think Nishandra needs an undead. I think she needed to wed Vendrick to claim the first flame, but he ran away to the crypt where she couldn't follow him, so she needed a replacement, the bearer of the curse. I think that's why she led us here. If you proceed, Nishandra will come after you, knowing that you will take the throne and link the fire. She covets the first flame and the great soul. In a similar manner, I think, we wed Anri in this bizarre murder ritual and can subsequently claim the first flame like Nishandra wanted to. I always found it strange that a being of dark would want to claim the first flame. I just thought they would want to stop people linking it and let it die, but in Dark Souls 3 we learn that you can usurp it and we learn that those of Londor are making a real push for that to happen. So, Dark Souls 2 aside, in the Lord of Hollows ending of Dark Souls 3, we stifle the first flame within our bodies and collapse. When we rise, reborn, you see this beautiful little detail. You see the sun in the background is no longer red like the dark sign, it's ringed with white, and there's this illusion where we lift this new sun into the sky, signaling and symbolizing a new age for mankind. This video is crazy long, but the best is yet to come. There's two things I'm very excited about seeing in the next DLC, and I do think it's really likely that we'll get Londor DLC. So one is that there's this boss in Dark Souls 1 that was called Undead King Jaril, and he was cut from the new Londo experience of Dark Souls 1, and I have a lot of fond memories of discovering Jaril from another Dark Souls YouTuber, Hellkite Drake. He's really good at digging in the game's files. So since New Londo mirrors Londor, which I guess is New New Londo, uh, I'm pretty hyped to maybe fight Jaril in the DLC, who knows. But the biggest curiosity, and you see a clue in the thumbnail, is Velka, the goddess of sin, because I personally think it's undeniable that Velka is heavily involved in Londor. And Velka, the goddess of sin, is one of the most influential and curiously, the most absent characters of the Soul series. So Velka, the goddess of sin, is a rogue deity, but she is versed in arts both new and old, and is considered to have a great range of influence even as gods are concerned. So let me convince you of her involvement in Londor. So her followers wear uniform black, just like the three founders of the Sable Church, and one of them in Dark Souls 1 was called Oswald, who was an inhuman swordsman, a fencer to be exact, just like the three daughters who founded the Sable Church. And in Dark Souls 1 and 2, these servants of Velka were called the Pardoners, men who listened to the confessions of sinners and the keywords being, they offered salvation. The Sable Church, too, is also said to offer salvation. So I think if anyone is going to be the mother to the three daughters of the Sable Church, then I would put my money on Velka, 100%. Many spells, like Vow of Silence, are the spells and rites of Velka in Dark Souls 1, and in Dark Souls 3, they're said to originate from Londor. In Dark Souls 1, also, were the Clutch Rings, that were said to reach out to the Crestfallen and prevent despair. In previous games, they were said to belong to a dark deity, and here, now, in Dark Souls 3, those same rings are fabled in Londor to prevent the despair of men. Speaking of rings, we get the sacrifice rings from Yol's ashes, the hollow ashes, and the sacrifice rings also directly reference Velka. I'm still going with my list. Uh, Velka also oversees the Dark Moon list of the guilty in Dark Souls 1, which was a covenant led by Dark Sun Gwyndolin, and in Dark Souls 3, this could explain why we sacrifice Anri within the Dark Moon tomb. She has a relationship with the Dark Moons as well, so it's crazy the amount of links there are here. But one more, 
There is a lonely statue of Velka in the Undead Settlement, and this statue can dissolve hollowing. It can cure hollowing in the same way that a purging stone does. So Velka is irrefutably linked to the Dark Sign and the Sable Church of Londor. I think that's pretty undeniable. But most curious is she is a rogue goddess the other gods feared, and hell, I wouldn't be surprised if Velka is the one that holds the final few secrets of the Dark Souls series. Wouldn't it make sense if Velka was the one punishing the world for the first sin? Yeah, food for thought. Time will tell. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you all soon.